our keynote speaker replied. As per the program, here's Gibson Barrow, use him as you will. <laughs> so that's it. Gibson, please, the floor is yours. I'd like to thank the uh, EGOS organising committee for affording me the uh, opportunity and the honour, thank you very much, uh, of speaking to friends and colleagues in such beautiful surroundings. Uh, I may well invoke uh, Alto's building in my talk at some point, but it's a spe spectacular location in any event and for any event. Now I have several endings to this talk, but only one beginning. Uh, the person I live with uh, said to me before I came up here the following. Gibson, she said, we're on first name terms at the moment, but we won't be after this talk. <laughs> she said, Gibson, be professional, please. <laughs> Don't gossip, she said. Don't tell tales. This is the biggest group of your peers that you'll ever talk to. They won't all understand British sardonic humour. <laughs> so be serious, be straight, and above all, there's a repetition here, be professional. <laughs> Don't be abusive about people in the room. Forgive and forget. <laughs> and then with one panic look, she was gone. <laughs> now professional, of course but not quite yet. <laughs> Forgive and forget, eh? Well, over the last 40 years, I've kept a list. <laughs> I've kept a list of people who have been horrid to me. <laughs> it's a list of infamy. And if you know the carry-on joke, it's coming. And my God, this lot have had an infamy. It should play better than that, but never mind. You haven't seen the carry-on joke. So, a list of infamy that I'm going to read out. It's payback time if your name is mentioned. I don't know if the mic will pick me up, yeah? 1971. I told you it was 40 years old. October, 1971, Whitley, Richard. 1971, November, Spender, JC. 1971, later that November, well, I could go on. Now, the thing about a role, and this is now me being professional, the thing about a role is, it's a technology which has been around about 1,500 years. Okay? Let's see how long Kindle lasts. Yeah? So, the, the, there are designs that have stood the test of time, and there are designs which uh, have not. So, over the last five years, in a stuttering sort of way, which is the talk will be, uh, I've tried to think about issues of de design and the way in which we might uh, think about that. And as usual, one finds something of interest in Michel Foucault's work. And I hope you can see this at the back. Um, it may, uh, we've tried to uh, improve the slide. In the preface to the English edition of The Order of Things, Foucault argues he was attempting to uncover the deepest strata of Western culture, a rather ambitious activity. Even more ambitious, he asks what's common to the people in the natural sciences, to the economists, to the grammarians. So here he's trying to link the natural sciences, the social sciences, and the humanities and bring things together. And his answer, of course, in the order of things, which was not a total success, as nothing is, says that the same rules are used by these people to define their objects of study, to build their theories, to form their concepts. So they were subject to the same rules of formation which he attempted to uncover. Now this was a hugely ambitious project, an awfully big adventure as we would say. 
And I ask myself, and dare say some of you ask yourself, where are the big adventures today in organisation studies? Where are our sagas as compared to our footnotes? And I think possibly we should flirt more with danger than with safety. And I don't mean flirting with danger in the way in which Martin Parker wears strange shirts. <laughs> it has to be a genuine sort of danger. So as I say, he's a genuine danger. Um, particularly since he's my we've done it tonight. Uh, a five year stuttering project I've already mentioned. And of course one of the dangers is who asks for the genesis. You ask for where do things come from. But let's just start from that, the dangerous question about what are the origins of organisation theory. And I think one has to look at the Mesopotamian creation myths, 10,000 years old, in the valleys of the Tigris Euphrates. And what you find there is something of great relevance to organisation theory, and that is the avoiding, the avoiding of the void. That is, how do we fill in the form and content of the world in which we live? And you get this many uh, millennia later in the Bible. Almost the first few lines of Genesis say, now the earth was formless and empty. A big problem for organization studies. <laughs> Anybody? So interestingly, in the Bible, and I'm no Bible scholar, but interestingly, form and content are laminated. So that what we're told is that chaos is subdued by the creation of form, night and day, and by, and water and sky, and by filling it with content, vegetation, animals, and so on. So what we've got here is a materialist paradise of matter in the right place. There's no dirt until the apple, of course, is taken. So the Garden of Eden is God's rule of formation. Now in another Mesopotamia, between two other rivers, the Rhine and the Danube, the notion of man, and I use man advisedly, rather than humanity, the role of man gathers momentum. So a whole series of wills to develop. So Schopenhauer's the will to live, Nietzsche's the will to power, Freud the will to pleasure, Frankl's the will to meaning. Now these are supposedly ideational forces which drive human beings forward. But there's little utopianism here, there's little sense of the Garden of Eden. These are survivalist wills. These are wills which come from wanting to survive in a world which is created as a wilderness. By human beings, maybe. So what I want to talk about is the will to form. This is another will, but I'd like to think it's a hugely important will for organization theory. Because in the face of the wilderness, there's a material and an ideational ordering of things. We create shelter, containment, security, boundedness, protection for ourselves, for our nuclear families, for our disciplines. That's what we're doing, the will to form. So edifices of various kinds, in which the Garden of Eden is one, but our textbooks and a whole variety of other things are too. They represent stabilizing practices in the organizing of organization. So these human constructions provide safe houses for the rude winds while they're met and the bitter weather. Now in looking at this, again, one looks to the usual places and in Marx in Das Kapital, volume one, what you get in the description of the architect and the bee, the very famous one, is issues of relevance to the will to form. I think it's a good expression of the will to form. There's imaginization of the object. There's the meeting place of materiality and the ideation of the dialectical synthesis. But it's a parable. It's a parable of the meeting of politics, of economics, of arts, crafts, and sciences. So in that description of uh, the architect and the bee, is a pre-design of the architecture of systems that I have in mind as a key exemplar of the world to fall. Now this is an important point because I'm making some uh, large connections here and I need a drink before I make a large connection. <laughs> what you've got in Marx 
is the connection of political economic systems. All economic systems are political, all right? So political economic systems. But they are linked in passages in Das Kapital with architecture and with organization and with design. And if you look at the Oxford English Dictionary in a sad sort of way, what you discover is the way in which words are defined, these words, systems, architecture, organization, design, often involve the other three words. It's amazing if you look at these uh, definitions in detail that they, the, the compilers, use the other words to describe the first. So there are some very, very strong connections between these words. So strong that you might be able to work out a base definition. So this is what I have to offer so far, these rules of formation. This describes all of those four things, I would argue. A deliberate plan and purpose that deals practically and functionally with the coordination of elements into an orderly structure that's in working order. I think that would define all of those. It doesn't define them totally, but it defines them. So the hybridization of these words, they trip off the tongue by definition. So organizational design, which quite a lot of people are going to talk about and have talked about, it trips off the tongue because to organize is to be designed and to design is to organize. Similarly, systems architecture. It's almost as if they're tautological. Because when you say one, you invoke the other. So if they're tautologies, in other words, by definition, you're talking about each of these together, perhaps we should be emphasizing the intra-actions between them rather than the interactions. So these four elements, political economic systems, architecture, organization and design, are tautologically linked almost, and we're talking about the intra-actions between them. So there are four things. Sorry, that's, yeah, there are four things on the go here. Now, there are other sheltering edifices in, in the world to form, I haven't got time to go into. But there are divisions. And as we know in Derrida, and Bob Cooper's done this in our own field to talk about the way in which that happens. There are grids, grids of intelligibility, which is Foucault. There are records, and I was at the business history session today, and the importance of records, and we know from Weber. Carl Weig talks about maps and the importance of them. Recipes, the, the J.C. Spender of whom I spoke, talks about those. Patterns, right across the piece. Now I mentioned the Intizam Almanza, or excuse my pronunciation, because this is an Arab word to describe the organization of the view. And as far as visiting Arabs to Paris were concerned, they could not understand how the view was organized. Why should the view be organized? Why should there be a focal point for the viewer? And when uh, Herman Melville went to Cairo, he could not understand that there was not an organization of the view. So the point I'm trying to get at here is, this is Egos, we're talking about a European approach, and so, maybe a North Atlantic approach. So what I'm talking about here is limited. It's limited in time and space. But it's very dependent on geometries. Now these are elementary forms of the organized, organized life, the staple of text on organizational design. So we could do a lecture, couldn't we, on a triangle, a circle, and a kind of network. Because we're locked into elementary geometries, it's the kind of way in which we think. So there's geometry in the style of organizing, I would argue, and you don't have to kind of read Charles Handy to know that. But Charles Handy made a reputation with it through a number of books through those simple sorts of geometries. So Deleuze and Guattari dichotomize between royal and nomadic geometry. The former emphasizes the stopping of worlds in a plan using planes or paper in office. And that's what this talk is, I'm afraid. But the latter refers to the cutting of stone by hand on a building site using the method of squaring, the classic separation between conception and execution. So my talk hereafter is the ribbon of a royal science, but use your hands if you want to. So Ching, who's an architect, talks about geometries of the point, of the line, of the plane, of the void, 
create significant forms and structures of meaning, and that's what I'm going to argue. He, Ching, uses two-dimensional drawings to suggest 3D shapes, and this is a classic problem of cubism, of course, of the hidden face of the other, never seeing the other side of the cube. And Finlandia Hall and the, the architecture of the building has got cubist elements to it, which I don't have time to kind of reflect on too much, but here in this building itself are the issues about the way in which cubes are formed. And following the late and great Max Buzzer, what I intend to do is to develop a 3D perspective to styles of organizing as best I can using a cuboid conceptual space. But first, the style. Now, style in the West, for echo, style is a literary issue about forming an argument. And for Barbara, I don't know if Barbara's in the room, but style is a way of executing a task, a technique of making a thing. But style may not be about adornment, but it's about wounding. Styling is not necessarily something that's on the surface. It can cut very, very deep. <coughs> so the stylus may well be a weapon. Thus, the pen, you know, we say in English, the pen is mightier than the sword. In fact, the pen is a sword. It cuts, it deforms, it executes. And so when we're looking at styles, we're not just talking about the superficial. There are deep lacerations which come when we look at styles and styles of organization. So style is driven by aesthetics, of course, but also by excavating a deep sort of materiality on the flesh. So a concern, a concern for styles of organizing involves three interrelated problems. It's the wounding, the cutting, the incision of materials. And had I got the time, you know, I could show some excerpts from the movie Moulin Rouge, where style is used to build up character, to cut and to wound, and to show the way in which the narrative can develop. And it does so beautifully. I also would need to say something about the problem of what's meant by organizing. And organizing, of course, is different from organization. There's a whole debate which is going on about, has gone on about being and becoming. But what I'm concerned about, as I'll show in some of the images maybe, is the importance of organizing rather than organization. And also, I've got the problem of how I'm going to suture what is being made separate uh, in what I'm about to say. So what then is my suturology and uh, neologism? Well, I'm going to engage in commensuration, which is the problematic nature of a process of transforming disparate forms of value into homogeneous units. And of course, this leads to information reduction, uncertainty, absorption, simplification, and decision-making. And in Britain, we have a whole set of adverts for a company called CompareTheMarket.com, which uh, I suspect have not travelled, but that's a process of commensuration, whereby you force into a Procrustean bed a variety of different things. That's what I'm going to do. And Borg is in uh, using the talk of the certain Chinese encyclopedia. Foucault begins with, in the order of things, that's the kind of thing that I'm going to engage in. So, there are a number of parameters to the, divine, uh, the design envelope I'm about to talk about. Three lines, six faces, eight points of extremity, a void to fill with content. And what I'm going to say is, this is of relevance to you. The design cube presented after this is an awfully big adventure. It's a kind of grid of intelligibility. It's a hurtful wounding of the material, making it grow. And a number of you, indeed the majority of you, as you leave the building, may moan and groan about the way in which I forced some of this material into different sorts of works. It's an uncertainty reduction using common metrics, and I'm assuming uh, commensuration. I'll engage in the saving of the other. Now, for a long time in organization theory, as you know, We've had economists have a look over the fence, which I hope carries a high voltage between us and economics, but maybe doesn't. <laughs> so I'm going to engage in the saving of the other. I'm going to talk about economics a little bit, 
uh, from the perspective of organization theory. And I'm going to ask the Foucauldian question, what's common to the natural sciences, the economists, the grammarians? So, I'm looking back here. The aims of this design envelope I'm about to talk about are to demonstrate the importance of the will to form to organization theory. And of course, I'm just breezing, blasting through this. To show that the will to form a uh, safe material and the ideational house may well be expressed differentially in different styles of organizing. Yeah, so the styles of organizing arise from the will to form. These styles operate across the human sciences and erupt from particular solutions to particular problems. So they're connected rhizomatically. They come and emerge in different places through their intra-actions, not least of which is the tautological definitional base. All right? Because these words are defined in terms of each other, there is a basis there for seeing them as rhizomatic kind of outgroups. So, having looked back, what I'm going to argue is how one stands in relation to three issues, in turn affecting the humanities, the social science, and the natural science, govern one's location within the design envelope. So, three dimensions here. What the hell do I mean by sensibility and rationality, by sedimentism and rupturism, a part of nature or apart from nature? Now, lines, as you will know from your geometry, are made up of points. So there are a huge number of points which link sensibility at one end and rationality at the other. So the intermediate positions are myriad ones. And I haven't got time to go into here about what they are. I'm going to look at two sides of the road where there are two separate schools arguing with, with each other, okay? I didn't express that very well, but you know what I'm talking about. So this is the points of opposition at either side of two lines, three lines. Sensibility, then, is a belief in the importance of undescribable emotions and the soul to understanding of selfhood. Rationality, at the other end, diametrically opposed, is the use of rations, of ratios, of ratiocination, and the ratinibus, the accountant, to deduce objective truth. And of course, you would want to ask questions about it. I haven't got time, but at some point, you know, I'd be very happy to talk about it. Sedimentism is the idea that social structures are laid down in the sands of time, and the future social processes will be governed by these self-same processes of accretion. Rupturism is the notion that social science structures break suddenly and dramatically, and are replaced by innovative and distinctive forms. A part of nature assumes humanity is fully integrated into the natural world. Apart from nature, articulates the fundamental separation of humanity from the confines of a natural world. So we have three different dimensions that I think are made up of a number of points and we all have to come to positions on these. So, I'm no artist, apologies. If David Muscle is in the room, he needs a better artist to do this than me. But what this is, is trying to look at the planes that are created by this. So hopefully you will see that there are points that I've labeled by letters and that there are planes. So a part of nature is separate from a part from nature. Sensibility and uh, rationality are apart. Rupture <coughs> and sedimentism. But that intellectual space is the design envelope, as far as I can see. And it's the set of designs from which we can draw. There are lots of positions within that, but there is a set of confinement uh, within that space. So there are six planes. Every positioning provides for a way of organizing and a way of not organizing. Now you might imagine that all organizations are to be found on or around the plane of rationality. That's what we say in our textbooks. They are not. Many inhabit the plane of sensibility. These, and I borrow this, that's the mass of unargued, unexamined, and largely unconscious assumptions which represent the fantasies of a period. Now, hierarchalism 
the belief that we need hierarchy in every organization, to me, is one of sensibility, not of rationality. It's an assertion. But that is what one needs to do, I think. Examine carefully what the designs are and place them within some sort of framework. Now, I've only got one, uh, one time here for another ex one other example, and that is to look at two faces, to look at typical organizations. So the plane of a part of nature are focused on Greenpeace, that most of us heard about. The plane of a part from nature, opposite, facing opposite across a big wide chasm, is Blackwater. Blackwater Incorporated, which in the United States is renamed itself twice, which is always a bad sign. Okay, not a very good picture of uh, Greenpeace, but questioning plans, server uh, cooling costs, and so on. And here is Blackwater Inc., now called Z, and actually since I've popped this up, I've discovered it's called something else. Now this street uh, that you see here is New Orleans. The first uh, uh, rescue attempts that went into New Orleans, that Bush sent in, were in fact black water to protect property. So this is them walking through the streets of New Orleans. The, the one on the right is uh, one of their advertising uh, pieces, and below is the Great Dismal Swamp. That's what it's called, where black water is based and where it gets its name from. And you'll see it's on fire. It's on fire because the tracer bullets that are used by Blackwater have set uh, all the vegetation alight. Because Blackwater um, is the largest uh, non-state military facility in the world, in the Great Dismal Swamp. So all I can do is to try and say, one can look at the design of these uh, organizations in terms of where they stand. Had I got time, I could build those up into two cases. I want to spend the, the, what's left of my time on the eight points of opposition. So you remember that each of the corners has a, a letter, and each of these corners is the extreme location of an extreme design point. So point A is where extreme sensibility, extreme sedimentism, extreme view of the world as we are a part of nature is located. And opposed to that is point F. So I'm going to do this in the way of opposition. I'm going to show two opposing sides to try and get the point over. But of course there are different ways of doing that, but I'm going to do it in an oppositional way. So point A is the extreme point. I think we can learn a lot from extremes living dangerously where the dangerous kind of points are. So point A is there, and at the opposite end of the cube that I'm talking about is point F, where rupturism, rationalism, and apart from nature, are located. So the eight labeled extremities there are there, and these are clear examples of these rhizomatic expressions. Now what I mean by elements of style is a very broad-based perspective. Because what I mean by style, because these are rhizomatic eruptions of the same definition, I'm going to look at the political, the political economic system as a reflection of style, the philosophical framework, the design and architectural style, the buildings maybe, the embellishments and symbols that you'd find, a descriptor that comes from looking at the literature and organization of exemplars. And you can see in the few minutes that are left to me, that's not going to be easy. But I have taken 100,000 words to try and articulate this. So, these are the elements of style which I think one can look at. I'm going to look at the extreme points. Now, presentationally, for each point, and I'm going to have to speed up, There'll be a taster of what one might find in all of these elements. And then a very brief image that I'm going to try and get on. If any of you think that you'd be more interested in uh, the images, then you know, we'd need to have a lot more uh, kind of pictures of presentations. Now sometimes this image is of an organization, sometimes a building, sometimes a design item. 
For each element, images are readily available, but as I say, time presses. So point A, this is where sensibility, sedimentism, and naturalism are focused, and I would label that as green environmentalism. I would say its philosophical framework was derived from romanticism. A good design style would be Gaudi and the Barcelona apartment block. The symbol that you tend to get, to get often involves the sinuous kind of intertwined leaves. A descriptor that architects use sometimes is it's excessively imaginative and dormant. And then at this point, some people who are Brits might laugh, but the National Trust seems to me to reflect some of that. Point F, it's opposite. Neoliberalism, we all know what that is. I would tie into a libertarian pragmatism, modernism as a style, Wittgenstein's house, I'm gonna show you a picture of that, perfectly machined window handles, I'll explain that in a sec, uh, autistic decorationless perfection, and Ford's motor company in the 20s and 30s might reflect that. So not very good pictures, but this on the left, is Wittgenstein's house. Wittgenstein had the money and the wherewithal to spend three years designing this. And if people have said it's the product of an autistic person, he spent ages designing the window handles. His office in Cambridge apparently had an electric fire, a deck chair, and that was it. So this is somebody that wants to strip out all excessive ornamentation. And if you look at the apartment block of Gaudi, that does not describe it. So I've chosen two buildings here to reflect different styles, but let's move on. Point B, uh, Schumpeterian creative destruction, I think ties to postmodernism. Deconstructionism is the design. Uh, Frank Gehry, Strati, MIT building. Explosive alteration and the organization example for that is Virgin Galactic, I would argue. The point E, its opposite, is national protectionism, conservatism, and so on. You know, I, I don't want to read these out, you can read them for yourselves, but the white painted picket fence at the University of Virginia exemplifies quite a lot of this. But the organizational example I've taken is a village. It's not an organization as such, it's a community called Tilting in Newfoundland. Here in New Mexico is Virgin Galactic's headquarters. For about a quarter of a million dollars, you will be able to go in space for six minutes. But it has elements of what I was trying to articulate, opposed to this Tilting Newfoundland. It's frozen most of the time. People move the houses around on the frozen uh, lakes. It's an example of an organization the organizing of a village because the fishing has all done that in Newfoundland. It's moved towards a conservationist kind of perspective in heritage. Okay, uh, point C, the potlash economics, uh, surrealism, magic realism is its philosophical. Gothic is important to this. The collapsing tower, tarot card, you may know. Freedom Tower in New York, that building strikes me as having some of these elements. It's opposed to bright green environmentalism, Buckminster Fuller's work, the Darmaxigan, geodesic domes, Enval is environmental uh, aluminium company, and I only mention that because it seems that once you're up here, you have to mention your own students. Um, one of our students at Leicester uh, set this company up on Cambridge Science Park. Now this, for those of a Freudian bent, may suggest all kinds of things. Um, but on the left is the, the geodesic uh, dome, and on the right is the tarot card of the collapsing tower. These images are stylistic images that have relevance to organizational studies, I would argue. The last two, you'd be pleased to know, um, Maoism and the Wobblies, links to anarcho-communism, Victor Hora's Art Nouveau, the House of the People of Brussels that was destroyed in the 1960s, the Zapatistas. You know, I, I will do talk about the Zapatistas in relation to this. And the last point, point H, uh, Keynesianism, absolutism. Those two don't usually go together, but you know, I would try and explain that to the Baroque. 
to the Palace of Versailles, the Grotto, Trompe d'Oeil, and Enron. How come Enron? Because Zapatista Art is there. The Enron dealer room, as some of you know, was at Trompe d'Oeil because it was not actually functioning. It was only where visitors were taken to suggest that certain types of dealing were going on. So we're now finished, folks. The design cube, then, is a conceptual void, conceivable, I would argue, as an envelope, constrained by the answers given to specific questions containing points, lines, faces. This envelope contains and constrains political, political economic systems, design, organizing, architecture. I forced them in there, but nevertheless, there are commonalities. It suggests that there are distinctive pattern books which exist for different parts of the cube. Choice exists, but it's not very large. It points to the existence of style wars. How do style wars get articulated? But style wars in economics as well. Not only in terms of you know, the Gothic and the neoclassical. So we might not like the style of our containment, but we do have a choice. And here, despite Gareth Morgan's 1986 book, uh, these are design metaphors for organizational theories. I told you I had a choice of three. This is the nice cuddly end. I'm not sure I'm going to finish on this. Um, but have a look, please, at those images. And if you are able to say, well, one of these appeals to me much more than others, then you have found what kind of positioning in the design cube you're most comfortable with. Intertwined leaves or decorationalist perfection? Karen and I disagree about our garden. That's another reason why we don't speak to each other. <laughs> Explosive alteration or the white painted picket fence? Which kind of image appeals? The collapsing tower or the geodesic dome? Sunlit poppies or the hidden rotter? So it may be that you like more than one, in which case, you know, positioning may well uh, vary inside the design cube that I'm suggesting. That's the nice end, I'm not going to end there. So your choice speaks of preferred style of organising. But of course, while design is contested, multiple, ongoing, a matter of choice, it has but one function. And the organization of organize, sorry, the organizing of organization is derivative, I would argue, of a will to form, which produces a shelter in which we hide from chaos. Organization theorists spend their time hiding from chaos but so does almost every human being. The will to form stops us, whether organization theorists or not, from peering into the fathomless abyss. And here is the third ending. When one looks at human capacities to design and so on, often, the vast majority of the time, these end in failure. And what they end in is vomit and tears. That's the way in which our lives will probably end. Vomit and tears. Now, I think that the vast majority of conferences I've been to in the last 40 years have had an element of vomit and tears. In it. <laughs> so roll on tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs>